Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today we're joined by Dr. Pete Friesen. Pete is currently an adjunct professor at Duke, Elon, and Arcadia Universities in the schools of physical therapy. He also teaches post-professional physical therapy and athletic training courses in dry needling and exercise progression. In 2018-2019, Pete was the head strength and conditioning coach for the United States Women's National Hockey Program, which won the World Championships. In 2017-18, he worked with North Carolina State University's track and field and cross-country teams. Prior to that, he spent 21 years with the Carolina Hurricanes as the head athletic trainer, strength and conditioning coach, and massage therapist. Friesen was responsible for training and dietary standards, preparation of rehab programs, and acute injury treatment players. During his tenure with the Hurricanes, they were in the Stanley Cup Finals twice and won the Stanley Cup in 2006. With over 42 years as a professional trainer, Friesen is a dual board certified physical therapist in sports and orthopedics and certified in the United States and Canada as an athletic trainer, strength and conditioning specialist, massage therapist, and dry needler. Friesen has been associated with the Canadian Olympic and international programs for 30 seasons. This includes serving for Team Canada at five senior world championships, winning the gold medal during the 2004 World Championships. Pete has also been to 10 IIHF junior world championships with five gold medals. Lastly, he advised nine different Canadian programs, including men's and women's ice hockey, field hockey, soccer, figure skating, softball, wrestling, gymnastics, and volleyball. Before joining the Hurricanes, Friesen was the head athletic trainer for the Prince Albert Raiders, the University of Saskatchewan, the University of Alberta, and assistant director at the Glen Sather Sports Medicine Clinics in Edmonton. During his time in Prince Albert, Saskatoon, and Edmonton, he was on several teams that won national finals, especially being on the University of Alberta's Pandas five-time national winning volleyball teams. Had an amazing conversation with Pete. Uh, his career, 21 years as a high-performance professional in the National Hockey League, the sustainability, his, his job description, essentially a Swiss Army knife, PT, AT, massage therapist and strength and conditioning coach, what makes a good coach, and advice to young coaches coming up now uh, in the current landscape of high-performance hockey. It was a great conversation. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Pete. Thanks so much for joining us. Anthony, it's a privilege. I'm humbled to be one of your guests because I've listened to the previous ones and uh, you've had some star stellar people on the podcast. So thank you very much for the invite. Hey, I, I, uh, I just had a conversation last week with one of your very good friends, another legend in what we do, uh, Reg Grant. And uh, did he ever talk so highly of you? And I want to start by asking, the same question I asked Reg when, when we started, I wanted to ask him, how did you get involved in coaching? I know coaching for you is, is a lot. You wear a lot of hats, massage, AT, PT, strength and conditioning. And, and then what was the specific event that led you to the National Hockey League? Uh, I don't think there was a specific event, uh, to be honest with you. Just out of university, uh, I was kind of looking for a job or, or multiple jobs to pay off debt and stuff like that. And the uh, Prince Albert Raiders, uh, oh, yeah. obviously in Saskatchewan, uh, they needed uh, somebody to you know be their trainer. And I literally had no experience as being a trainer or anything with ice hockey. I, I actually was you know uh, more into Nordic skiing and things like that. So, but I needed the money or the job. Actually, the money. Uh, I didn't really know. <laughs> Uh, much about the job but uh, anyways uh, at that time in that particular and that this is 42 years ago wow. uh, I took my first job in hockey and uh, the coach at the time he, I thought he, he was a legend it, now his legacy still goes on in the WHL and the SJHL but his name was Terry Simpson anyways okay. I, I think he hired me because he could trust me and he didn't care mm -hmm. about my background and, and th th this is where I got my multiple hats from because Terry gave me a chance to be everything. I could. I was the, the equipment manager. I was the physical therapist. Wow. I was the athletic trainer. I was also the bus driver. And Terry was always a, a very frugal man, kind of like myself, not cheap, but frugal. And he also allowed me to run sort of the meals and stuff like that. And so I'd, um, uh, I, I would run the meals for our road trips and stuff like that. And, you know, to be honest with you, it turned out to be a good gig. Uh, we went on to win two national championships uh, in major junior hockey, which, uh, 
again, one of the things I was lucky enough, I got to meet him. I got to meet a lot of great hockey players and coaches. And so that led one led one thing led to another. And then I started in with Dave King. I never had wow. the aspirations of ever going to the NHL. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for my wife telling me to take a job in the NHL, uh, I would still be probably in major junior hockey or else working at the U of S or the university of Alberta as a strength coach. Wow. What an yeah. interesting, what an interesting story. Speaking of the national hockey league, 21 years is an unbelievable, unbelievable journey. Sustainability. I, I can't, I, I don't know right now the current tenure of who's the longest track strength coach in the national hockey league. I don't know that. I know Reg, we spoke before 17 years, sustainability in that position. I asked Reg that question and he said one word, empathy. Do you have, is there a, a characteristic that you felt really allowed you to sustain, aside from your content knowledge, obviously you're a very bright person. Is there a, is there a quality that you thought helped really sustain 21 years of high performance? Well, one, I appreciate saying bright and uh, I might be, but I think I'm knowledgeable, not bright. And also to uh, my time in the, the NHL, I, I want to just tell you something because uh, I feel like I'm a humble person, but also I want to kind of brag a little bit in the fact that I think I'm the only person in pro sports that's held all four positions at one time for multiple years. So I had a lot of targets on my back, uh, wow. you know, because you can always blame the strength coach, you can blame the trainer, the PT, <laughs> yeah. you know, the massage therapist is a flake and stuff like that. So <laughs> I carried all those roles for a long time in the NHL, but I can tell you something. What I, I thought that helped me get through it is I always did more than what was expected. Yes. Now, that's how maybe I start to carry more and more titles as I went on in the NHL and um, even my players. And so I learned from my players, but, you know, they go away in the spring and they come back in the fall and they'd say, what did you do to get better? And uh, that really left an impression on me in the fact that every year, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's during the season and that's tough. But especially during the off season, I would do think courses or, or go and hang around mentors and things like that in order to get better. And then also, I think to this day, I show Pat, if you ask my athletes in the past, you know, they don't give care that my education level or, or uh, my certification stuff, but they will tell you that, that kid was passionate and enthusiastic every day. And I felt like I was sort of the gatekeeper to people's emotions. And so we could yeah. have lost really bad or want, well, you know, just to keep people fired up. And so I think that that really helped me with my sustainability, albeit it, it, when I looking back, 21 years doesn't seem like a long time, but uh, I, I guess it is. We spoke off the air and I, I, I wanted to thank you for coming on our podcast. And I, I, I joked around with you. I said, you got more kick than a garlic milkshake. Everybody in the room lightens up when you, when you get in it. And that's a testament to you. I imagine that that culture that you built over those 21 years was very much the same. You know, it was, it was a good day to play hockey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, if you can't get excited and, you know, I think, but honestly, and if you see my resume, I've, I've been with a lot of teams, not just hockey, but sure. you know what we do, we are so blessed and so fortunate in order to go to work every day. And, you know, honestly, if you can't get fired up about that, well, either you don't have blood pressure or you're in the wrong profession. And yeah. I would say that's the same for any profession, but that's what my attitude was. I believe every day. Uh, and even still today, when I, you know, work with athletes, I'm that fired up about it. And so I think that helped to, to my sustainability in, in the NHL for sure. Uh, absolutely. So the, your history in high performance, specifically the national hockey league, obviously, Obviously, you know, 21 years, uh, coaching changes, uh, lessons, mistakes made. Could you could, could you expand on, on some of the, the really important lessons? I, I think failure is a part of success, right? Uh, success is failure turned inside out. Were there were there lessons that you learned and said, "Wow, okay, uh, what an awesome life lesson," or "What an awesome lesson from the practice that I'll I'll, I'll, I'll make better next time during those 21 years"? Is anything you could share with us? Oh, there's lots, uh, to be honest with you. You know, uh, just so you know, like pro sports is pro sports. It's not amateur sports. And there's a big difference in the fact that, you know, uh, you got to learn that early because if yeah. you don't, uh, it's going to side hit you and uh, it's going to disrail sort of your, your mindset or your career. But, you know, like when a new hospital system or something like that comes in and you develop friends with your orthopedic surgeons and, you, you know, maybe your strength coaches or whatever, that can change overnight just because another hospital or medical system comes in. And so you got to learn to roll with that. That doesn't make the new system bad. 
It just means that, you know, it's a financial at the end of the day, they got to pay their players and stuff like that. So that's an important lesson to know in pro sports, I think. And uh, I didn't realize that at the time. And so it kind of set me back sure. uh, a little bit, but uh, yeah. And also too, the other thing about uh, being a pro, don't ever think you can't be replaced. Everybody can be replaced. Bobby Orr was replaced. Sure. You know, uh, Wayne Gretzky was replaced and stuff like that. And, and you know, the other thing is too, and going back to this other thing is that, uh, you know, I think, and I don't know if it's just my old age or maybe it's always been this way, but I really believe that pro sports, a lot of them has, have lost their, you know, those traditional values that I wanted to go into sports with like loyalty and gratitude and, you know, just those tr traditional values I think are disappearing. But I believe in my heart, the better organizations have never lost them and they will grain them again uh, sort of thing if you want to have a winning culture. And so those are kind of management things or things that I yeah. saw that kind of blindsided me when I went into pro sports because I thought I was going to be like amateur, but even better. Yeah. But in actual fact, no, you, you know, if you don't know a guy's contract or, or what line he's playing and stuff like that, you're going to soon learn uh, that, you know, somebody <laughs> that's in the first line needs to be on the ice a lot more than somebody that's on the fourth line uh, and their, their contract. And, you know, are they at the end of their contract or the beginning of their contract? All of these things have, you know, you have to understand that in order to serve the athlete and the team as best as possible. From a management standpoint, did you feel a culture was sustained by management? Uh, did Was it an uphill battle, maybe is a better question, for you to have a culture within your performance department and the job that you did with a conflicting culture from the gatekeepers or the or the or the the management or the or the or the coaching staff or was it always a quote unquote utopia where you matched those 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 visions uh, during your time there uh, and your career? Uh you know, to be honest with you, I, I'm just, it's a, a lot of times th there's two levels, you know, like senior manager, GM, owner and yep. stuff like that. They don't, they might have some input onto culture, but really it's the coach and it's the players. And I gotta be honest, I'm not bragging on, but you know, Rod Brindamore, you oh. know, to be honest with you, I was a strength coach, but you know what, if you have a Rod Brindamore on your team, you don't really need somebody that's isolated as a strength coach because Roddy made sure that all of those boys were in the weight room working their butts off when they could. You know, I mean, we set a culture. I got to be honest, I'll tell you a quick story. We were in New Jersey one year and this is when we, we were really building up steam. We we're great, getting great. And anyways, I had a post game workout and some of the media that were from New Jersey came in and looked, you know, we're looking to get some stories and stuff like that. Sure. And one of the guys says, Holy smokes, what do you guys do after a loss? Because we just beat New Jersey and we were working out as hard as anybody could ever think after a game. But that was a culture. And sure. I gotta be honest with you, what, what, and you probably know, like you gotta marry, if that guy, that leaders, the leaders on your team are with the coaches that are with the trainers and the strength coaches, it makes that culture magical. But you have to have everybody on the same line. You know, you can have one or two bad apples, but if you have many more than that, you know, it really takes away from the whole essence. And, you know, we were a team that were never really depth in talent. So we had to outwork people. And, and I believe yeah. that that's, that was an important thing for culture is the coach and, and Paul Maurice. I don't know if you know him, but, yeah, he, I, you know, yeah. he, and Peter Laviolette, I had some great coaches that endorsed what I did and also what Roddy did. And so we were able to make some really magical times in that uh, locker room, which I felt were even more important than the games themselves. But, albeit, you know, I'm narrow minded. I've uh, I've heard that that culture sustains right now as a head coach for him. You know, he's unpacking uh, the team uh, charter flights that we've seen on video. Right. Rod Brindamore. Yeah. He works yeah. out with the guys, which I, if you if you're not going to sell, <laughs> if you're if yeah. you're the head coach working out, <laughs> you know, if you don't think that's important for the young guys to to to, to, to pay attention to. Wow. What a culture that 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 he continues uh, to possess in, in terms of now being a head coach. Yeah. Now, when you said that, the hair on my forearm start to rise up, man. You're exactly right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is that he added so much to it. And I think that's invaluable. Uh, you know, a lot of yeah. times people said, you know, how can you be the strength coach and the trainer at the same time? I said one, you know, Rod Brindamore. Uh, that's how I can be it. Because, you know, I'll be honest with you, it's so important to have your best players sending your, you know, singing your message. Yeah. And you couldn't ask for a better person. Uh, that's fantastic. Challenges. Uh, we talked about some, some important uh, lessons that you've learned along the way. We talked about this before, but you're a Swiss army knife. Like this is uh, uh, fantastic. Massage therapy, AT, PT, strength and conditioning. That is a lot of hats to wear. I mean, you're a Swiss army knife. 
were there during your career, were there challenges or were you, did you ever feel like you were spread too thin as an individual or individuals wearing multiple hats? You know, I, if you ask some of my players, maybe they'd say yes. Uh, but again, a lot of times people want to be treated when they want to be treated. But if you sure. can be regimented, you know, like have people come in at a certain time for therapy or stay a certain time for massage and stuff like that. I always felt I could handle the workload, uh, to be honest with you. And also, you know, uh, there was never any uh, failing communication. Uh, because sure. I have to communicate myself, whether that this guy is getting weaker, if he's rehabilitated from that injury, you know, if he has abnormal muscle tone or trigger points that some massage might be able to help and stuff like that. So I feel honestly that uh, in some ways I made up for it, you know, being yeah. short staffed or whatever. Uh, but also, uh, you know, I don't know. Like I've been in a lot of hockey rooms where there's a lot of people sitting around drinking coffee, doing nothing and actually maybe speaking about stuff that's really none of their concern. And sure. I got to be honest, I'd rather have people that are busy uh, than are not busy in, in the room, because I think that, the, you know, guys just sitting around waiting for the guys to come off the ice or or, you know, get changed or showered or whatever to work out. You, you know, that, that doesn't create a great environment. You know sure. I mean? Uh, if you're there, you should be all hands in and so hands on sort of thing. And that's, could we have used more people? Yes. But uh, you, it's really tough. Like I know we, we talked about like how many people are like these strength staffs and sports medicine staffs that I see today, you know, there's six to eight people where we used to have just two people uh, yeah. and that two people, one equipment guy and one uh, uh, therapist. Now they're, they're huge. And I'm not saying there's not work for them, but there's got to be somebody really directing that. So they all work together and they're all pulling on the same rope sure. because I know that you could spend a lot more time with development in the minors, uh, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or and draft pick, the, you know, looking at junior hockey and who we're going to draft and stuff like that. Or, you know, like breaking down a, a data that is significant to the players. So, it, you know, I'm not belittling or thinking that the staffs are too big right now, but I do think that there's a lot of times they're not doing much. And, sure. But if they all are creative and working hard and a collective purpose, well, then those staffs are probably, you know, justifiable. If you think, uh, if you were to uh, right now construct your own National Hockey League Performance Department, you walk in tomorrow, what would it encompass? Now, we talked about this and you, you hit on it briefly. Right now, uh, in the National Hockey League, I, I, again, I, I know every uh, program uh, and every team has a, a different uh, makeup from a structural standpoint, but let's just say hypothetical director of sports performance, you got your strength and conditioning, AT, PT, mental skills, skills coaches, and potentially RTP coaches, you know, are we overstaffed right now? Or if you, if you, if you blew this thing up and walked in day one, who do you think the biggest players would be on the staff? How many would, how many would it uh, comprise and who would it be? Yeah, I got, be, that's a great question. And the th fact is what I would do uh, if I had that, uh, you know, experience, I, I would start with minimal and then just keep adding people out. You know, sure. I, I, I would want a, a great AT. Uh, I got to be honest with you. I'd like to have a, a, a strength coach and a massage therapist. And I would imagine every one of those individuals obviously qualified, but elite communicators as well, right? You got to have no ego when you do things like this and, and work as a staff, as, as a staff, as a unit. I, I totally agree. I, you, you have to be like that, to be honest with you, because communication, it, it's a little tougher in the NHL, I think, than other sports. And the fact that I have to communicate to people from Russia, you know, from uh, Czech, uh, sure. from Finland, and, and they all have different ways uh, of dealing with things. You know, be honest with you, a lot of Europeans hate taking antibiotics. And if they do take antibiotics, uh, they don't want to play. And you huh. go, are you kidding me? That would never happen. One, in North America, we take antibiotics at a drop of a hat. But the point being is you've got to have empathy or understand where they're coming from. You've got to understand a lot of these guys, especially, you, you know, we've had a lot of influence in, in uh, uh, ice hockey uh, with, you know, ways of training. But, you know, a lot of Europeans used to just do body weight exercises and they mm -hmm. came across and they were fantastic. You know what I mean? But you got to understand there's different ways to, to for strength and conditioning. You get, that communication's got to be open and know that there's more than one way of achieving it. But, you know. The reason why I would start small is that you got to develop those communication lines. And so yeah. if you have a massive uh, thing, you don't know what they're communicating. And our, our uh, profession, it's bad. You know, maybe this is a PhD thing, but we got to get better terminology. You know, for example, Bulgarian squits, split squats, that could be named two or three different things. 
Who sure. knows? But sure. only, you can see why there's breakdown in communication and usually the player suffers for it. So that's why I would start with a small staff and build out from there. But also to job description is really important. Yep. Job description, but not only job description, but it's everybody's job. You know what I mean? Like I hate to see when people yeah. say, well, uh, I'm the trainer, so I'm not going to pick up that towel. That's the equipment guy's job. That's not the way it's got to work. You got to know your job, but also know other people's job and help them whenever you can. That's a team approach. And if you ever sign an agreement with uh, USA sports or Canadian sports, and I know I've signed these things, your job role is always do your job and anything else that's asked of you. And that's the way I think that you need to build a, a sports medicine team. What a great answer. Iteration, which really is the essence of science, really, right? You start, you realize after you do something, potentially problems. And when I say problems, opportunities, and then you you layer from there, right? There's, you know, almost like this deal with technology. A lot of times, uh, you know, you see in, 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 in sport, it's it's who owns the right, this technology without having a problem to solve in the first place. You know, yeah. um, it, it, the exactly. same you, you, you would suggest with the staff, you start small, you, you communicate, you realize there's potential opportunities or weaknesses, and then you scale from there based on those weaknesses or opportunities. Accurate? Yeah, exactly. Because if I don't know your strengths, or we, I'm not going to hire another person that has the same strengths as you. And I don't know sure. your strengths until I actually, you know, and I, honestly, I listen to podcasts all the time. I, I read, you know, some people are great writers. But sure. yet they don't have that real background to be writing what they do or they verbalize things that are they sound unbelievable. But, you know, I always tell you, you got to watch me work with an athlete first and foremost before you can kind of judge me as a strength coach. Because if you yeah. do and you like it, that's the kind of guy I am. But you have to actually, you know, be physically present. You can't do that, you know, through Zoom interviews and stuff like that. And that's why I really think that you got to start small and then grow from there. Yeah. Too many of these guys are growing too big, too fast, and they're redundant. I know NHL teams, just for, you know, going back, that they've changed their metrics, you know, from, you know, the polar uh, to uh, different metrics. How they, sure. and, and they don't know what's better. And, and they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on developing the metrics that they want to take from their athletes. And at the end of the day, they don't know what metrics they want. Uh, sure. So it's, sure. it's and the same thing with your staff, I think, too. But, you know, like, and I can't mention this enough, is that it, Ego's got to be parked, uh, you know, check your ego at the door and communication. Cause if you don't have that, uh, I've seen where, you know, things blow up on teams, you know, where, where everybody gets fired, you know what I mean? Because they just can't get along. It's funny. There's so many parallels to our conversation with Reg, but one of the things he said, um, you know, what is early days, at least in the national hockey league, he said, is, I, I didn't want to come in and change things abruptly. I wanted to learn oh. the culture. I wanted to learn the athletes. I wanted to take, I wanted to get a personal relationship with the guys and, and lean on them. And then from there, once I built that trust, once I built that understanding and it might happen from guys actually literally watching me work at development camps, it's watching me, you know, this is his early days in the national hockey league. And I thought, wow, you know, I, I, I can, I can point my thumb. Uh, I've, I've on many instances, I've made mistakes. Like, you know, you want to come in and change things too fast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, did that parallel, did some of those experiences parallel at your time in the national hockey league? So, uh, yeah, it does to a point, but uh, you know, I, I was blessed uh, because uh, prior to my starting, uh, like I was 40 years old when I started in the NHL. Yep. The previous 20 years, I spent a lot of time with Canadian hockey sure. and uh, went to a whole bunch of junior tournaments and senior tournaments. So I knew most of those elite hockey players that were now with the Hartford Whalers. And yep. so I had honestly immediate buy-in because I had a history with these players and awesome. uh, they were usually the best players on the team sort of thing. So that helped me a lot to get, you know, to build up trust with the other players. But Reg hits the you know nail on the head. If you don't have trust of the players, if they don't know like how much you care, you're never going to be successful. And so I agree with what he said. Uh, and you, th those things have to, you got to get, if you try and come in by yourself and develop a culture that ain't, they're going to think you're stupid or, or you know, yeah. Yeah. wing nut. You got to know how, and it's lingo, right? Like, yeah. again, like people in hockey speak differently than people in other sports. As a matter of fact, I, one time I made up a t-shirt, a summer t-shirt with all the little slang things that hockey players say, you know, and I think it went over quite well because it, yeah. it is a unique language and you got to learn that in sure. order to talk with these guys successfully. Absolutely. Metrics we talked about, uh, we briefly, briefly hit on. During your career, what did you feel were important metrics that you tracked? Was it essentially strength? Was it 
I know now we have the ability to track uh, track you know, things like GPS, external load, internal load, and sleep tracking, et cetera. Rewind back to your your time in the National Hockey League. At that time, what did you feel was important to track? Oh, well, it's a good question. Uh, you know, at that time, I'll be honest with you, uh, uh, body weight. And I know that uh, you would say, well, and that was even tough to get body weight from these guys on a regular basis. It's so funny that now I, I, we talk to a lot of the, 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 the coaches uh, that they're actually camouflaging their body weight just by jumping on a force plate. They'll get their body weight readings because <laughs> it prevents the players from having to have one extra step and going over on the scale because of what you just talked about. At times, it's getting hard to get body weights. Oh, I, I have a story about Paul Coffey uh, one time. Paul Coffey is probably one of the best defensemen oh, yeah. uh, candidate, or maybe the world's ever seen. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah. Skate it like crazy. Man, uh, uh, a couple of things about Paul. Do we have time to talk oh, of about Of course. Paul? Yes, of course. Anyways, Paul uh, Coffey. Actually, uh, the other really great learning experience I had is that I was in Edmonton and stuff in the 80s when we were actually doing physiological testing on, on the Oilers when no other team in the NHL was doing it. And sure. so that was kind of exciting. Actually, all of that research only was recently published, uh, to be honest with you, because it was confidential, wow. because it was wow. a you know professional team and stuff like that, which is truly unfortunate. But again, you know, I got to mix in with those uh, people sort of thing. But and also one unbelievable thing with Paul Coff, you always look at that metrics, but that guy could skate backwards into a corner faster than most people could do it forward. <laughs> and I was wondering, was why elite. does Paul Coffey skate backwards into a corner? Well, Paul Coffey's only about five foot seven, five foot eight, maybe 175 pounds. He didn't want to get hit. And so yeah. he developed that skill sort of thing. But anyways, we're trying to get his weight. And he, he uh, and so we want to get daily weigh in. And if you didn't, it'd be a $15 fine. He'd just qu- often just come up and give me a hundred bucks. Say, listen, let me know when that, when this runs out and I'll give you another hundred bucks. He didn't want to weigh in. But, hey, another quick story about weight. Can I tell you? Of course. Yeah. And you probably already know this, yep. but this yep. is for somebody that might not know it. But yep. uh, I had this defenseman, he was about 210 pounds. And uh, so I wanted to see how much weight he would lose during a game. Right. Uh, so uh-huh. easy question. Yep. So I, I, I put him on the weigh scales. And what I did is I weighed all of his dry clothes uh, at the beginning of the game and him. And then after every period, he'd come in, take his clothes off and I'd weigh them. Uh, or if he put dry ones on. My point being is that by the end of the game, he was down to 198. So we went from 210 to 198, lost 12 pounds. But guess where I found those 12 pounds? Where'd you find those 12 pounds? Well, his underwear went from less than a pound to four pounds. Uh, His uh, pants went up uh, a significant... I I, I just... yeah. The only thing that really stands out to me is that you know, his underwear went up, got so heavy. But the point being is that not only that 12 pounds did he lose, but he was actually carrying that shit around yeah. for the rest of the game. So that was about, you know, a 24 pound. D- d- so that's important to keep track of your, not only the, you know, the internal mecca, but also the, the environmental constraints, i.e. the sure. equipment and how much weight that is. <laughs> because at the end of a game, third period, you're carrying an extra 12 pounds and you're down 12 pounds. You can do the math. That's a lot more work for the athlete. But anyways, weight is an important thing, not just, you know, to recover it the next day. That was one. The other metric that, you know, when I, and the, the way they judged me a lot, you know, longevity, right? Oh, uh, you're games, talking games about games, yeah, games, games missed. But not only that, if you talk to coaches, they don't even give so much, they do care about that, but also practice is missed. Huh. Because to be honest with you, that's how you get better. You know, if you miss a practice and you miss multiple and you just show up for games, you know, that's a really big thing. And you talk to a coach and you say, yeah, you're right on. It's not just the games. We need you on the ice in order to get better. Your power play, you know, not you, maybe you might be the Paul Coffey, but you got to get everybody else on the team catching your outlet passes and be able to keep up to your speed. So th- those metrics, I think, are really important. And that's what I kept up uh, uh, initially, to be honest with you. But then as it went on and even now. It's getting cumbersome. And they actually say, if you don't follow most of those metrics for at least four years, they're no good to you. It's funny. I, I had a, I had a talk, a, a talk with a, a, an athlete, a, a former national hockey league player that I had the, the opportunity and the privilege of training for three years, Mark Latestu, and just a great guy. And I asked him about this idea. He recently retired coaching the American hockey league now. And I asked him about this idea of metrics and what he thought was valuable. And he said, you know, Anthony, he said, I'll be honest with you. He said, to me, I understand the reason for this. He said, but to me, uh, you know, my career was a little different. I I was, I played on multiple teams. He said, I never had any longitudinal data to look at. He said, so I was comparing 
different tests year over year with different teams, with different, with different, uh, you know, uh, targets, with different anchors. To me as a player, you know, I, 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 I would have preferred to see that now. Obviously, that, that would be a, a perfect world, right? No one plays unless you're, you know, not many play, pe- players play and have that longitudinal data over career. But I understand your point. It would be not much better to see that. That, 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 that improvement or those markers, whether it's internal load, external load, or inputs, outputs over time. Yeah, no question. And I think that honestly, if you want to get them valuable and reliable, you have to do that over time. So I don't know, there's such a saturation with, with uh, that data right now that it kind of scares me with the direction we're going right now. What you, I, I want to ask you your, your candid th- thoughts on this. What is the direction you think we're going? Like, do you, do you feel... I, I obviously, I'm I, I, I'm a big proponent of uh, objective measures. I'm, I think it's really important. I, I also, on the other side of the sword, I also think, wow, you know, the really, 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 really difficult stuff is the hardest to, or you know, is the hardest to measure, right? Like start from the scoreboard and work backwards. We said it a million times on the podcast. Th- those things are really hard to measure. What are your thoughts in the current landscape? Are we overdoing metrics or is it where it needs to be at the moment in the National Hockey League regarding performance? Uh, a good question. I don't know if there anybody can answer that, but uh, I'll tell you something that the new, I think the direction, honestly, but uh, I'm an old fella and sure. I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, most of my professors all came, they were, they were in Korea and they were in Vietnam. Uh, and so the point being is that if you learned how to do an exercise, you did it correctly. There was no if or not. Like I, I see so many people like even criticizing a burpee right now, uh, to be honest with you. And they say it's a silly thing. I think they don't know how to do a burpee then because yeah. you can't ask for your center of gravity change greater than a burpee. You can't ask if done correctly for all of your hip joints or joints to go into flexion and extension. It's an ideal thing. Same with a ladder, but it's used incorrectly. But uh, I'm just telling you like, and th- that's in all of my professions, not just strength sure. coaches. I, I just see strength coaches. They don't even really know how to do a plank, you, you know, without correctly to be honest sure. or a push up or sure. and it's, that's a, and it's even magnified with uh, physical therapists and athletic yeah. trainers you know the basics we're forgetting the basics uh, i think that one our direction is going to go back to the basics you know my old dr- drill sergeants uh, we're going to teach more motor learning skills and that goes yeah. back to what i think and what's evolved especially with concussion training i think that with concussion uh, evaluation we evolve that we know how to use the brain completely all parts of it you know They find that, you know, like a guy like Tiger Woods, he only uses a very small part of his brain when he's hitting the puck or driver, whereas a a, a very novice player uses all of his brain. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking that where our next big step is, is with neuroplasticity and performance neurology. I think we've almost tapped out with physiology and biomechanics. Now we got to go back to the basics. You know what I mean? How much can the brain contribute to enhance movement? So that's where I think that the strength and conditioning field is going to go in the future but I, I i don't know like that's where i think that's where my practice is going right now like what my ladder work really quickly like when i'm doing ladder drills yeah. i don't do it just for well quick feet stupid because if you're looking down at your feet you know as a hockey player you're going to get smacked yeah. you yeah. got to have your head and you got to have your head on a swivel things that our coaches have been telling us for hundreds of years you got to apply that to your drills i think that you know North America, God bless us, is that we brought a lot of bodybuilding exercises in, powerlifting and stuff like that. But traditionally, if you looked at the Russians and how they traded, trained in the 60s and 50s, sure. you know, that, that was more movement pattern stuff. You know what I mean? Yep. And, you know, that's what kind of got me interested in studying this stuff more is that, you know, you looked at what they were doing especially in the 72 series, which was a magical year for the, oh, the yeah. Canadians. You looked at uh, the, their goaltenders and all of it, they were fit as heck. And they came over and said, you know, you get, well, one, we weren't training much at all. Those, and, but the ones that were, were training hard, but yeah. Uh, so that's the, the I, I think the future sure. in my mind. And can I tell you something? I think that we yeah. learn, like we learn from all professions, right? And I think we're learning now, uh, you know, that this new direction that I foresee with strength and condition, using the brain more and, and motor learning more because we're learning that through functional MRIs. Most of our stuff is actually does come from the medical field. Sure. And I think the more you can pick up on other fields, the better you're going to be in your specific profession. Yeah. You know? No um, doubt. No, no doubt. No doubt. I, I, I couldn't agree more. We, we talk about this on the podcast 
there are so many things and, and, and guests that we want to have on the podcast that have nothing to do with hockey, but everything to do with hockey. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, it might be, uh, you know, thinking under chaotic circumstances. It might be rules of thumb or heuristics that you can use based off previous events when thinking fast. Little things that, 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 that you can always apply in different professions to the game and the way you think and evolve as a practitioner. I, I want to pivot a little bit. 2006 Stanley Cup champions. So I just want to ask first and foremost, how does it feel having your name on the Stanley Cup, baby? Come on now, you got to have a, you got to, you got to have a smile. That's got to be such a proud moment. Take us through that emotion. Oh man. Well, you know, I gotta be honest. I was there. I was in the Stanley cup finals in 02. Yep. I thought uh, uh, we lost to the Detroit Red Wings in five games. And I thought for sure that was the closest I was ever going to get to the Stanley cup. And, and it was the point like right after the game, uh, we were in Detroit. I went and sat on the bench and watched how the Detroit Red Wings celebrated that cup uh, because it was magical. You know, uh, no matter, you know, how nice these new stadiums are, oh, yeah. you know, seeing the Detroit Red Wings win in Joe Lewis arena, it's pretty darn special. It, and again, uh, it brings back real fond memories, almost oh. a lump in my throat. Anyways, go ahead to 2006 and uh, we're making an unbelievable run. And that's a story in itself, to be honest with you, because we had a coach that put a story together for us. And, you know, he had a vision and I swear to God, that's in, in pivotal. Uh, you got to have somebody that believes. And, and that guy believed more than anything. Uh, that wow. we were going to win the Stanley Cup. We had the Olympics during that year too, which he was the head coach for. But anyways, um, you, you know, even I remember one time uh, we were losing to uh, the, I think they're called the Phoenix Coyotes at that time, but uh, yeah. it, the Coyotes and uh, we lost really bad. And, uh, it was like 7-1 and we were rolling pretty good. But the only thing is uh, he, the next day he told the team, listen, we're never going to play that bad again. And you know what? The guys believed him. <laughs> Yeah. And we didn't. <laughs> so yeah. anyways, uh, we, 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 you know, we had a, just a magical season with many, many stories and stuff like that. And to be yeah. honest with you, this is where I kind of with Peter Laviolette, I always it wasn't the cup itself. Uh, honestly, it was nice to, to always say, but it was all the trials and tribulations that we went through that year to get there. That's what I remember most about the Stanley Cup year, to be honest. And I can go, you know, do we have time for a quick story? Of course, there's plenty of time. Love okay, it. in February of that year, uh, we had this player and his name was, and Eric has told me I can tell this story, but we had this, and it's actually on YouTube, but uh, he was the leading scorer in the NHL. Well, yeah. we never had a leading scorer in the NHL with Carolina Hurricanes. Yep. Anyways, we're in Pittsburgh and he gets drilled from behind into the boards, breaks his neck. Well, I got to be honest with you, you got the leading scorer on your team that you never had before. Oh. The wind could have come out of our sails, right? Wow. But it didn't because our coach had a vision. And it's not that we didn't care about Eric at all. We, everybody did. It was, re, you know, that's the other thing is he was still an integral part of our team throughout that whole process, a sort of thing. Anyways, uh, I, I trained that kid up. You know, he broke his neck. He had to be in a, a he didn't have surgery. Or inter, he had a, a body cast sort of thing, a body brace where it braces your neck, your torso and your hips. And so it's really awkward to move around. It's terrible to wear. But anyways, he had to wear that for two or three months. And then he got out of it. We started training him just because, you know, he's part of the team coming to the rink and we just don't want to have people sitting around, i.e. whether it's sports staff, sports medicine staff or our players. We got so we I started working with him pretty much every day uh, skating afterwards and stuff like that. Anyways, as the season goes on, we're making the playoffs. Wow. He's continuing to train because his buddies are on the team. He's part of the team, even though he has had this bad injury. So we get get into the playoffs. We go through first, second, and third round. He, he's getting feeling pretty good about himself because he's getting more and more. I'm skating him, so I know how much he's doing. He's doing sure. dry land training. But anyways, game six, we were in Edmonton, okay, and it was prior to that. He says, "Pete, I'm ready to go. Uh, we're I, I'm fired up. I, you know, I says." Well, Eric, we haven't done it like significant neck strength training. And I'm a stickler for neck strength training. Yep. Uh, to be honest with you, they're like, I look at the short neck flexors and stuff like that, how they relate with the superficial muscles. But anyways, you know, again, this is another point is that you got to get on board with the, the team sort of thing. Anyways, we had this meeting uh, and there's the NHL doctors. Uh, we had the, the PA doctors. We had our doctors. We had the, the, the coach, him, you know, anybody that had a decision in this thing. We had this meeting in, in the uh hotel room in Edmonton. And, uh, at the end of the discussion, uh, we sent him for a CT scan, which showed that there was good union and stuff like that. But they said, okay, who doesn't want this guy in the lineup? 
I was the only guy who put up my hand. I said, I don't want this guy in the lineup because, you know, be honest, you know what NHL yeah. the playoff hockey is. <laughs> when they hit, it's with uh, no. Anyways, I was the only guy who voted against it. But I thought I'm pretty offended because I've been working with this guy for a long period of time. Yep. Uh, you know, why don't you listen to me? But anyways, I was only one voice. You know, everybody else was. And that's one thing that I really respected about Peter Laviolette, because he, when we left that meeting, he says, Pete, I know how you feel. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that has to write my name on the players form uh, for the game. And he says, uh, I'll take full responsibility. Like, it doesn't matter who, what responsibility. Yep. Anyways, as the story goes on, he starts game six in Edmonton. He's the starting lineup. Wow. Well, you can imagine emotion. <laughs> Wow. He gets walked right off his keister, the first hit, the first shift. And I mean, this guy came and hit him with vengeance. Wow. Eric jumps up and says, it's going to take a lot more than that to get me out of this game. Now I start almost crying right now because to be honest with you, I knew that, you know, we're going to be okay. We went on to just screw up that game badly. Uh, we lost, but we came back and won the Stanley Cup at home. Point being is that winning a Stanley Cup is one thing. Winning at home is another thing. Having your son as a stick boy is another thing. Oh. Having Andrew Ladd hand my son the, the cup on the ice, those are things that uh, stick out in my mind and I'll take to my grave. And I think my son and my family will too. And also, it's kind of neat that your name's going to be on the cup for the next 60, oh, 70 years. How amazing. Whatever it might be. How amazing. I, I, <laughs> was, was it just, was it, did you have that, that year, uh, the cup was, was there, was it, there's, there's something special. Was it the way communication was with the players? Was, was it a talent thing? Was it a, a narrative uh, displayed by the coaches? I, I get it. There's, there's talent and luck involved, but looking back at your 21 years, was there an ingredient that you saw in that team that you said, wow, th this one stood out and, and, and that potentially got us over the hump. I know hockey's a, a complicated sport. I know there's a million uh, variables at play, but is there anything you could put a finger on during that year where you thought, wow, that's a Stanley cup team. Yeah. Uh, and I've been on a lot of championship teams and I'll tell you something, they all kind of have the same ingredient, I think, and you okay. can feel it. You know, when you go into, hey, my son worked for the New England Patriots a couple of years ago and was working with them. And you could feel that when you go into their, uh, you know, a training room and stuff like uh, there's a feeling a family. And also everybody was included, you know, inclusive. Yep. You know, they're just learning about that in general. So being inclusive, you know what I mean? Yep. But that's what you need on a team. If you don't have inclusion, whether you're the stick boy or, or, or equipment manager or the trainer or whatever, you all are part of the team. And, you know, to be honest, that just doesn't happen. And I think our coach does a better job. Our coach at the time did a better job of that than I'd seen in many years. Because, you know, right from day one, we had to go to, you know, Monday night football. You know, like we spend enough time away from our families and stuff like that, albeit it was all inclusive. Uh, so sure. our family was expected to be at Monday night football uh, or all wow. of these regular yeah. parties or get together. So, you know, not only did I know you, I knew your kids, I knew your wife, I knew, you know, probably their parents too. Sure. That's the first time I got to really get to know Rod Binnemore's dad uh, sort of thing. And, and so you got to, and I think that that really helped. You know, like when you're on the road, a lot of times, you know, you didn't have to worry about your wife being alone because they had a group of wives that would hang around together. And it wasn't just the players' wives. It was everybody. Everybody was included. And I think that was the single most important thing to develop a winning. Uh, and then also, I'll tell you, the other thing is when we got, you know, we could pick up a couple of free agents and, and uh, Jim Rutherford did a phenomenal job of bringing in a guy named Mark Recchi. And oh, I'll tell yeah. you. Oh, yeah. I gotta be honest, you know, he's not a stellar uh, stud of fitness, but you know, he showed me more quick feet drills than I'd ever thought of. That's another point. You can learn from your players and especially a guy that's been around that long. He showed me things that I'd never seen before or since a sort of yeah. thing, you know, little tidbits that he, he would put into his daily workouts, you know, I mean, to maintain his feet. And he had a long career, you know, he, he was a phenomenal addition to our team that he didn't take away because, you know, at the end of the year and you're bringing in some of these new players, they can really distract from your team. And we didn't have that. You know, we, we, we th these guys were solid people that Jim Rutherford brought in to help us on the road. I like that story about Recky. He talked about, you know, learning from him as well. It, it, it's got to be at that level, right? There's got, it's got to be a cooperative approach. It can't be a dictatorial, hey, here's your workout, do it now. You got to educate the athlete, and if they come along with something, now I, I know everyone handles this differently, but I, I, I'm fond of saying so many times perception of the program may be more important than the program itself if the athlete believes in it. So yeah. there's got to be some 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 sprinkles of this or some sprinkles of that where you know 
they might be coming from a different uh, thought process or a different strength coach or a different way of doing things that are added into the program. Would you agree with that? Disagree with that? Oh, totally agree with it. Honestly, like uh, I, I've been uh, and I tried to fight it my initial time in the NHL. I, when I was young, I, I didn't work, never worked in the NHL, but I, I maybe it was just an ego thing for me. I, I but I, I tried to fight it as well. And now I'm to the point where, you know, if, if it's not hurting you, like if it's, you know, if it's something where we're looking at risk versus reward and you really feel that's helping you. Let's add a dose to that. If it makes you feel better about it. Hey, let's let's walk away from this workout feeling, you know, confident, you know. Yeah, I, I honestly agree with you 100. percent And if you do try and fight it, you know, like start doing something. You, you, you're. Uh, I'm humble enough to know I can learn something from everybody, and yeah. especially my athletes that have been pro athletes and playing hockey since they're like four, five, six years old. I can learn from those people. And if you really dig into their mindset and what they know, they usually make you a better strength coach. I believe uh, in my heart, and also it develops that trust, like Reg talked about. I agree with you. If you don't have that trust, you got to work for it. You got to work darn hard for it. And you know. I, I'll tell you another quick story. One time uh, when I first moved down here, uh, we were playing 90 miles away from Raleigh, where my hometown is. We were yep. playing in Greensboro. So every day we'd have to drive down there. You can imagine like we'd have a eight o'clock skate or eight 30 practice. We'd have to get up at five 30 in the morning, you know, skate, then hang around the rink and then play the game and then come back and do it over and over again. I was home 30 days uh, in my home. The first two years of my, uh, my career, the first year I was home 30 days during the hockey season. Anyways, uh, at the end of the first year, we had this athlete. His name was Gary Roberts. Oh, and uh, Gary was like, he's a leader. There's yeah. no question. Well, what, I, I don't know if you know him, but you yeah. know, his reputation precedes him. He's a workaholic. He, he really showed me the highest level of fitness and stuff or commitment. Uh, sure. But at the end of this season that I'd only spent 30 days in my house, uh, uh, he says, Pete, we're going to Los Angeles and we're going to train with this guru that he had on the West Coast for a couple of weeks. You try and tell your wife that after a hockey season that, hey, I'm going <laughs> with my buddy Gary uh, out to the West Coast. But we did. And the b- bottom line is we bonded. And, you know, uh, you know, again, I don't think that it was a great relationship. I learned a ton from him. I don't know if it was vice versa, uh, but I know I learned a lot from him. But I, I do know that I have his trust uh, because of, you know, the things that we did together. Uh, sorry, but anyways, a hundred percent. I, I, I uh, wanted to ask you a, a pivot question again, before, uh, before your advice to young uh, performance to, uh, coaches. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a, a while back, I think I saw a post that you made. It was brilliant. Uh, talk about this idea in your career, return to play specifically with skates. You talked about skate hollow. You talked about skating over the ice, skating into the ice with different hollows and coming back from injury. Do you remember that post that you talked about? I think it was an AD doctor post. And you talked about coming back from an AD doctor injury and possibly skating on a flatter hollow during that time because it was less bite into the ice. Something I never thought of, but your time in PT 18, the National Hockey League, did you look at small things like that when you were when you were talking about return to play? Because essentially the skate is and the blade is just as important as the shoe is in sprinting, right? Oh, yeah. Maybe even more important uh, because of the lever arm and stuff like that. And that's where I honestly, I, I have a problem with people that don't have experience because, you know, you talk to most ATs or PTs or even strength coaches, they don't even know how to measure hollow. Yeah. let alone that it's important for that uh, sort of thing. It's just like, you know, as a strength coach, do you remember the way Wayne Gretzky skated? He's really bent over, yeah, right? Yeah, he's, yeah, bent at the waist, yep. Do you know why he did that? I don't know why. Oh, so I'm just telling you something. Yeah. If you're treating with somebody that has low back pain, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, you're talking about the context and the actual mechanics of the stride and then and then a potential issue with that, correct? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Totally. The reason why Wayne Gretzky skated like that, uh, again, I, he doesn't, I met him a couple of times, but he wouldn't know my name, to be honest. With but the point being is that, you know, some of his colleagues that know him, I, I you yeah. know, the reason why he spent, was so low or bent over, and a lot of times you got to realize, why is he doing that? Well, his lie of his stick, he could get more of the lie on his stick on the ice and therefore be able to pass and facilitate shooting and stuff like that. That's the way he operated. Now, if you get that guy to stand up, you're just changing the ball mechanics of one of the best hockey. Well, no. 
I, although I think Bobby Orr was, but a lot of people say they call him the great one because he's the yeah. great one. But the point being is that's why he, you have to understand a lot of the way, the way people play the game and also how it's related to their injuries and also how it's related to their strength and conditioning. Now, going back to the hollow, I'll tell you something that that is so important, whether you're a defenseman or forward, do you dig into the ice? Do you not dig into the ice? Yeah. You know, a lot of times when you're looking at range of motion, you know, a trainer can go through internal, external rotation after coming off a cam pincher lesion. But you know how I evaluate a hockey player? One, How is their crossover? Can they right crossover? Can they back crossover? And, and look at that immediately from side to side sort of thing. But the other thing is just even laces. Do they have yeah. wax or cotton laces? Because if you got yeah. skate, just, you know, a lot yeah. of times we don't take care of the basics. You yeah. know, like John Wooden used to teach his athletes how to put their socks on how to lace their shoes. A lot of times I have to do that with my athletes that have skate bike. You know what I mean? But it, it, especially, you know, when I first broke into the league, I think I'm quite a bit older you, but point being is that we had leather skates and yeah. the point being is they'd stretch out. We had hockey players that had the strongest ankles in the world because a lot of the Europeans didn't even lace their damn skates up. Now they're graphite. And we have a whole host of other injuries and how to strength train them or prevent the injuries because you can't make the club in the tub. And so that's why you have to have that open communication. You know what I mean? And it's really important to know all of those factors. How does the athlete play? You know what I mean? What, what kind of equipment do you, you know, like just to tell you like what appalls me and I'm not an advocate of this, but you see the hockey, the gloves they have, yep. look at yep. Gretzky. He had 16 inches. Like they had that armadillo effect with yep. the elbow. Like that was great equipment as a trainer. You don't, you know, I told you, I want to prevent and injuries sure. and, uh, you know, it's practices but you know you got to take into consideration these things that are changing with the equipment to your strength and conditioning programs and, and all, those are kind of important variables uh, so that. going back to the hollow it's important and also too you need to know the ice conditions and does it change you know another quick sideline story much yeah. all canadians in, in the 90s they fired a lot of people out of their organization because their players kept getting concussions and they thought it was a strength coach or that's the way they coached or whatever you know what they found out is that their boards were solid as can be and so when you got rocked in montreal you were going into a hard surface and so they would get more concussions than any other team in the nhl you got to know those constraints you know what i mean so what a great story but it just is interesting i was just reading a book uh, for the second time and, and for the listeners i strongly recommend it it's by alain hesh called the physics of ice hockey and he talked about this idea and using physics, um, talked about the skating stride, talked about shooting, he talked about force of impact. And that from a, a physics standpoint is the change of kinetic energy divided by the deformation distance. So what we're doing here with protective equipment is we're trying to spread the deformation distance. Talked about concussions, just read it just the other day and he talked about stiffed boards. Stiff boards, not a lot of deformation distance. So you got a massive change of kinetic energy and you're not absorbing that over a larger space. Hence, in this case, concussions, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, and again, I think that that can apply to a lot of things that, that we see in ice hockey, not just concussions, but also the blade hollow and stuff like that. So uh, I think, it, it, you know, just like the blade hollow is important. I think the, the lie of a stick is important yes. to an athlete uh, too. So, or, or to, you know, the, knowing how they function on the ice, like you said, going from the scoreboard back, uh, yeah. I have a little bit different okay. belief in that. I think you got to go from the other side. Like uh, I think that, you know, that because of it's such a rigid lever, uh, uh, the skate dorsiflexion flexion is, we know that, right. But yeah. I, I gotta be honest with you. I think that we can actually, I, I'm kind of more into this neurotherapy, right. And sure. so that might be wishy washy, but you know, the feet have muscles too. Cool. And I don't think that many strength coaches, one, you know, when you're doing a screen, how many times do you do a screen with the athletes runners on most of the time, yeah. you know, I gotta be honest with you. Power lifters have been doing this for hundreds of years. They make sure that when they're doing a full squat, that all 10 toes are digging into the ground because that, they, they use their feet. As that. I'm just telling you, I think that we can make guys utilize their glutes better. I think that we can prevent injuries just by starting them from the foot up and work out like that. So sure. those are the metrics that I, I'm kind of the guy that fills the black hole. You know what I mean? I'm like <laughs> I, I, I never take success, credit for a person's success on the ice, but I do think that I can make sure that that body is moving as efficiently as possible. And I think that gets overlooked a lot of times, you know, like screening, you know, like, and I'm nothing about against screening, but the point being is that what about your coach's eye? Why can't you, and you know, you're too busy on the cell phone or you're talking to your buddy in the train. You look at those athletes, you know, be in their face, know what, how they're moving. That's 
the movement screen I'm talking about. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, stationary things where, where, where it's never practical. I don't think really is effective in high level sports. You know, I talked to Dan Faf about this and he, and, and I'm paraphrasing of course, but he said, you know, it's, 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 it's much, um, much more comfortable for most strength and conditioning coaches to, to coach in the weight room than it is on the field or on the ice. Meaning like, what are the biomechanics that you talked about of the sport? Uh, you talked about the stick and the skates. I mean, arguably two of the most important tools in the game of hockey. How do those influence biomechanics? Can we influence those off the ice? But if you don't know the four or five anchor points of what looks like an efficient hockey strides, clearly there's bandwidth to all those. How do you fix that if you don't know, right? If the answer is just you're uh, constantly a nail, right? You might need a screwdriver. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, the point being is that even if you ask a lot of strength, it's kind of an interesting question, but how much taller are you when you're on your skates? Yeah. How many people actually know that? And that's a simple thing. You know what yep. I mean? Because to be honest with you, when you're that tall, that's why you can't do all your conditioning on the ice because you're two and a half to three inches taller. And that puts a tremendous load on your lower back. Sure. I've done it. I've put guys on there. I thought we're only going to train on the ice. We're not going to train anywhere else. But guess what? We get low back pain. You can't do a significant amount of training there to strengthen because of the biomechanics of the skate and what that imposes further up the chain. And so uh, I think that, that you need the, those basic information before you know the other metrics are important absolutely yeah. okay advice um you've been around this game for a long long time what would your advice be right now um to uh, young performance director directors in today's national hockey league or young strength coaches in today's national hockey league you know i gotta be honest with it and i'm all, i was honestly even thinking before if it was me and I, I feel like I'm a lifelong learner, to be honest with you. And so I'm constantly taking courses, I'm teaching courses and um, still practical training people. But I got to be honest, with you, for me, I would go and visit you. I, I would say, OK, how long can I come and, and hang with you? Because to be honest with you, I, I feel you're a mentor of mine. And so I would first and foremost look for mentors. If you're in school, even if you're not making any money, it's valuable. And I don't know if you can realize that, but, you know, the first 20 years of my career, I didn't make hardly any money, to be honest with you. I was, uh, but I was around great mentors. And I guess, yeah. you know, the thing is, I was, mentors can be, you know, like physical therapists, strength coaches, but sometimes I think we underestimate being around the presence of great coaches. And oh. I, I gotta be honest, I was in the presence of great coaches my whole career. Like, I mean, guys that are selling, still out, you know, like in 1980, or 81, uh, I was with a guy named Dave King. Oh, golly. Coach for the Blue Jackets for a while. I think that he is, yep. uh, what an unbelievable human being he is. Yeah, and, and knowledge, like, uh, and huh. people still, you know, he kind of has a lineage of coaches and stuff yeah. like that. But in, in 1982 or 80, I, I think we won a national championship at the U of S, University of Saskatchewan with him at the helm. But point okay. being is that, you know, uh, we were talking, you know how Wayne Gretzky had this motto saying he's always going to sk- skate to where the puck was? Yep. Well, we had a motto is, what's your heart rate when you don't have the puck? And so we studied that way back in the end. And to be honest, this guy was a hockey coach. But this is where we were, our mindset was, is how hard is, you know, everybody's going to work hard when you got the puck, right? Sure. But the guys that are armed with the puck, that's guys that you got to worry about sort of thing. And we were worried about that in 1980 uh, sort of thing. But I learned things from training just from his background. Terry Simpson, I learned so much. You know, Billy Morris, Claire Drake, you know, the the list goes on and on. Uh, And I think sometimes... And if you're around winning coaches, you, you, you know that culture I talked to you about oh, in the yeah. 06? Oh, you, yeah. You get to feel that. And if you never get that, and that doesn't mean, but mentors are the first thing. I, I tell you, a young guy, go out of your way to do that. Uh, the other thing is, and I mentioned this earlier, but be humble enough to know you can learn something from everybody. Uh, because if you think you're better than everybody or anybody, that's going to stymie your career. And I guess the last thing is, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but like going back to what I I think that if you don't show passion and enthusiasm and flow with what you're doing right now, you're never going to move up the ladder because it's you're going to be evaluated on your day-to-day issues. And if you don't show that, people aren't going to ask you to be around high-level athletes. And so those are the things that I would tell a young coach if they want to stay around or if they want to move up. The, those are the attributes I think are are the most important, for me anyways. Our guest today has been Pete Friesen. Pete, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. It's a privilege. I hope our paths cross a little further down the way. Absolutely. <laughs>